Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 21. In this lecture, we'll discuss electromagnetic waves. This topic is covered in Chapter 35 of our textbook by Survey and Jouette. Matter consists of atoms, and atoms consist of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Of those three basic particles, neutrons have no electric charge. We say they are electrically neutral while protons have positive charge and electrons have negative charge. In our discussions of electromagnetic waves, we'll be primarily interested in charged particles like protons and electrons. If you've already taken a course on electrodynamics, some of this might look familiar to you. If you haven't, that's all right. The only thing that you really need to know is that charged particles create electric fields around themselves. The electric field in many ways resembles the gravitational field. For example, planet Earth creates a gravitational field around itself, and that gravitational field then affects or influences other objects like the moon that might be in orbit around Earth. Similarly, charged particles create electric fields around themselves. We represent the electric field using lines. If the source of the electric field is a positive charge, like a proton, then those lines point away from the source. If the source of the electric field is a negative charge, like an electron, then the field lines point towards the source. The field lines could look more complicated for more complicated arrangements of two or more charged particles, and calculating the exact shape of these field lines can be a difficult exercise. However, the important thing for us is that these field lines exist whenever there are charges present. Furthermore, if the source or the charged particle is at rest, then the electric field will also be static. If the charged particle is moving, for example, if the proton is moving in a particular direction, then the electric field is not static, the electric field will also move. After all, the electric field lines must emanate from the source, and therefore the electric field lines must in some sense follow the motion of the charged particle. In particular, if the charged particle begins to oscillate, then the electric fields will also begin to oscillate, and that's what we refer to as electromagnetic waves. So what exactly happens when a charged particle oscillates? While the particle sits there, be it an electron or a proton, it is surrounded by an electric field, and that electric field is static. However, oscillations of the charged particle can cause the electric field to oscillate. You can think of the electric field lines as if they are ropes extending out from the particle, and when the particle begins to move, the electric field begins to follow that motion, resulting in an oscillating electric field. Now, it so happens that oscillations in the electric field create a magnetic field which also oscillates. This is sometimes referred to as magnetic induction. We say that the electric field induces a magnetic field. This fact is not so easy to understand and requires an entire course on electrodynamics. Suffice it to say that the electric and magnetic fields are often found together. Either one can induce or create the other one. What this means is that as the electric field oscillates, it will be accompanied by an oscillating magnetic field. The oscillating electric and magnetic fields together are known as an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves have many interesting properties, but one of the most interesting is the fact that they can propagate through vacuum. It so happens that electric and magnetic fields can exist in vacuum. Certainly to create an electric field, one needs a charged particle like a proton or an electron. But the electric field that surrounds the charged particle can extend into outer space and exist in total vacuum. 
that electric field can exist in a region that is totally empty of all matter, including molecules, atoms, neutrons, protons, and electrons. What that means is that the oscillations in that electric field and the accompanying magnetic field can also exist in vacuum, and therefore electromagnetic waves do not require a material medium. Unlike the waves that we've been considering up until now, electromagnetic waves do not rely on rope molecules or water molecules or air molecules. They can propagate through vacuum from one point to another. For example, electromagnetic waves generated on the sun can reach planet Earth by traveling through the vast vacuum that separates the star from the planet. This is certainly an important distinction, but other than this distinction, electromagnetic waves have many of the same properties that ordinary waves have. Like most ordinary waves, an electromagnetic wave also has an amplitude, a wavelength, a period, and wave speed. Also, like ordinary waves, they exhibit many of the same phenomena that we have studied. For example, in connection with sound waves, we discussed the Doppler effect. It turns out that electromagnetic waves also experience the Doppler effect. They also experience interference, and they can also form standing waves. In fact, in future lectures, we'll discuss the interference of electromagnetic waves extensively. For better understanding, it helps to have a visual representation of electromagnetic waves. Note that an electromagnetic wave consists of simultaneous oscillations in the electric and magnetic fields. So one has to keep track of two things in order to understand electromagnetic waves. Here are some common representations of an electromagnetic wave. In this picture on the left, you see two sets of arrows. The red vectors represent the electric field, which is oscillating in magnitude, while the blue arrows represent the magnetic field, which is also simultaneously oscillating in magnitude. Note that the electric and the magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other in all of these examples. Also note that the two fields are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. For example, if the wave is propagating in the z direction, then the electric and the magnetic fields must point in the x and y directions. If the wave is propagating in the x direction, then the fields must point in the y and z directions. Since the fields are perpendicular to the direction of propagation, we describe electromagnetic waves as transverse waves. In this respect, electromagnetic waves are less like sound waves, which are longitudinal waves, and more like rope waves, which are also transverse waves. Of course, an electromagnetic wave is not a static object. It moves and it carries energy, so it helps to see an animation of an electromagnetic wave. In this animation, the wave is propagating from left to right, while the electric and magnetic fields point in perpendicular directions. Note that all three directions of space are being used. The wave propagates in one direction, the electric field points in another direction, and the magnetic field points in yet a third direction. As mentioned before, electromagnetic waves have many of the same properties as ordinary waves. In particular, the frequency of electromagnetic waves is going to be important to us because it's the frequency that determines many of the physical properties of electromagnetic waves. It so happens that the frequency of an electromagnetic wave is equal to the frequency of the oscillating charge that generated it. We describe the situation by saying that the source frequency determines the wave frequency. So, for example, if you have an electron that is oscillating with a frequency of 10 Hz, then it's, it's going to generate electromagnetic waves that also have a frequency of 10 Hz. We can view the electron or the source as the driving force and the frequency of the electromagnetic waves must match the frequency of the driving force. 
Because the frequency of electromagnetic waves determines many of their physical characteristics, we give electromagnetic waves with different frequencies different names. For example, electromagnetic waves that have a frequency of approximately 1 megahertz or 1 million hertz are referred to as AM radio waves. Electromagnetic waves that have a frequency of approximately 100 megahertz are referred to as FM radio waves. Your cell phone uses radio waves to communicate with the cell phone tower. Electromagnetic waves with a frequency of approximately 150 gigahertz or billion hertz are referred to as microwaves. You can use microwaves to heat water in the microwave oven. Electromagnetic waves with a frequency of approximately 600 terahertz are referred to as light. Your eyes are most sensitive to this frequency. You use electromagnetic waves of this frequency to see the world around you. Electromagnetic waves with a frequency of approximately 3 times 10 to the 18 hertz are referred to as x-rays. We use these electromagnetic waves to capture photographs of a broken bone in the doctor's office. The frequency can go even higher. Um, electromagnetic waves with a frequency of 3 times 10 to the 21 hertz are referred to as gamma rays. Here I'm listing the frequencies of these different types of electromagnetic waves, but of course one can also talk about the wavelengths of these electromagnetic waves. It turns out AM radio waves have a wavelength of approximately 300 meters. Incidentally, the frequency and the wavelength are related by the same formula that related frequency and wavelength for rope waves and sound waves. Recall that the wave speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. The same relationship holds here. It turns out that the wave speed for electromagnetic waves is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, at least in vacuum. We'll come back to the question of wave speed for electromagnetic waves in a later lecture. As I mentioned, the frequency of an electromagnetic wave determines its physical characteristics. A little more precisely, the frequency of an electromagnetic wave determines how it interacts with matter, with molecules and atoms. Much of 20th century physics was devoted to this question of why and how electromagnetic waves interact with atoms and molecules. In fact, quantum mechanics, an important branch of physics, was really the result of this question of the interaction between electromagnetic waves and atoms. This is a rather deep and complicated subject. In this class, we won't go much further uh, into this subject of interaction between atoms and electromagnetic waves. However, on this slide, I wanted to summarize some of the more interesting uh, aspects of electromagnetic waves. I've listed some of the different types of electromagnetic waves. As you can see, they go by many different names. We've already discussed radio waves and microwaves. It turns out infrared and ultraviolet rays are also electromagnetic waves with different frequencies. The frequencies are listed here, and as you can see, uh, the frequencies range from relatively small numbers, like 10 to the 4th, to relatively large numbers, like 10 to the 20th. And the wavelengths, similarly, range from relatively large numbers, like 10 to the 3rd, to relatively small numbers, like 10 to the minus 12th. Beneath each wavelength, you see a, an object whose size is approximately equal to the wavelength. Of the electromagnetic wave. For example, if you were to examine gamma rays and look at the wavelength of a gamma ray, like the peak to peak distance, you would see that that wavelength is approximately the same as the size of a nucleus. On the other hand, radio waves have relatively large wavelengths. The wavelength of a typical radio wave is approximately the size of a building. All of these um, different electromagnetic waves are generated by the sun, but not all of them reach us here on the surface of planet Earth. 
it turns out many of these electromagnetic waves are absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. For example, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays are all absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, so they cannot penetrate all the way down to the surface. And that's a good thing because usually electromagnetic waves with very high frequencies can be quite damaging to the human body. A little bit later in the course, we'll also learn that we can associate different frequencies with different colors and temperatures. For example, the sun, which is a relatively bright yellow object, has a surface temperature of about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, and most of the electromagnetic waves that are emitted by the sun fall into the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's end this lecture with a practice problem. The human eye can detect electromagnetic waves with wavelengths in the range 380 nanometers to 750 nanometers. What is the range of frequencies the human eye can detect? So as we've seen, electromagnetic waves occupy a very wide range of wavelengths and frequencies. However, the human eye, and more precisely the retina in the human eye, can pick up or detect only certain wavelengths. The human retina can detect only those wavelengths that are between 380 nanometers and 750 nanometers. It also turns out that different wavelengths and therefore different frequencies are perceived by the human eye and the human brain as different colors. So what we perceive as the color red corresponds to electromagnetic waves with longer wavelengths, like 750 nanometers, and what we perceive or see as the color blue or violet corresponds to shorter wavelengths, like 380 nanometers. So given this range of wavelengths, what's the range of frequencies that the human eye can detect? Electromagnetic waves obey the same fundamental relationships that other waves obey. In particular, we can say that the wave speed is equal to the wavelength divided by the period. 1 over the period, of course, is frequency. We can rearrange this equation and express frequency as wave speed divided by wavelength. We'll say much more about the wave speed of electromagnetic waves in our next lecture, but for now I'll just tell you that in vacuum, electromagnetic waves travel with a speed of approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We now have everything we need to calculate the frequencies. When the wavelength is 380 nanometers, the frequency is going to be the wave speed divided by the wavelength. Recall that the prefix nano indicates 10 to the minus 9, or 1 billionth, and when you put all of that into your calculator, you find that the frequency that corresponds to a wavelength of 380 nanometers is approximately 789.5 terahertz. And the prefix tera here corresponds to 10 to the 12. We can do a similar calculation for a wavelength of 750 nanometers when we place 750 nanometers into this equation over here with the same speed of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, we find that the frequency comes out to be 400 terahertz. So the human retina can detect wavelengths between 380 nanometers and 750 nanometers or frequencies between 400 terahertz and approximately 789 terahertz. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.